United Kingdom. Chapter 7. The Dean and Chapter Take Counsel All Barchester was in a tumult. Dr. Grantly could hardly get himself out of the cathedral porch before he exploded in his wrath. The old dean betook himself silently to his deanery, afraid to speak, and there sat, half stupefied, pondering many things in vain. Mr. Harding crept forth solitary and unhappy, and slowly passing beneath the elms of the close, could scarcely bring himself to believe that the words which he had heard had proceeded from the pulpit of barchester cathedral was he again to be disturbed was his whole life to be shown up as a useless sham a second time would he have to abdicate his precentorship as he had his wardenship and to give up chanting as he had given up his twelve old beadsmen and what if he did some other jupiter some other mr slope would come and turn him out of st cuthbert's surely he could not have been wrong all his life in chanting the litany as he had done he began, however, to have his doubts. Doubting himself was Mr. Harding's weakness. It is not, however, the usual fault of his order. Yes, all Barchester was in a tumult. It was not only the clergy who were affected. The laity also had listened to Mr. Slope's new doctrine, all with surprise some with indignation and some with a mixed feeling in which dislike of the preacher was not so strongly blended the old bishop and his chaplains the dean and his canons and minor canons the old choir and especially mr harding who was at the head of it had all been popular in barchester they had spent their money and done good the poor had not been ground down the clergy and society had neither been overbearing nor austere and the whole repute of the city was due to its ecclesiastical importance yet there were those who had heard mr slope with satisfaction it is so pleasant to receive a fillip of excitement when suffering from the dull routine of everyday life the anthems and te deums were in themselves delightful but they had been heard so often mr slope was certainly not delightful but he was new and moreover clever they had long thought it slow so said now many of the barchesterians to go on as they had done in their old humdrum way giving ear to none of the religious changes which were moving the world without people in advance of the age now had new ideas and it was quite time that barchester should go in advance mr slope might be right sunday had certainly not been strictly kept in barchester except as regarded the cathedral services indeed the two hours between services had long been appropriated to morning calls and hot luncheons then sunday schools really more ought to have been done as to sunday schools sabbath day schools mr slope had called them the late bishop had really not thought of sunday schools as he should have done these people probably did not reflect that catechisms and collects are quite as hard work to the young mind as book-keeping is to the elderly and that quite as little feeling of worship enters into the one task as the other and then as regarded that great question of musical services 
there might be much to be said on mr slope's side of the question it certainly was the fact that people went to the cathedral to hear the music etc etc and so a party absolutely formed itself in barchester on mr slope's side of the question this consisted among the upper classes chiefly of ladies no man that is no gentleman could possibly be attracted by mr slope or consent to sit at the feet of so abhorrent a gamaliel ladies are sometimes less nice in their appreciation of physical disqualification provided that a man speak to them well they will listen though he speak from a mouth never so deformed and hideous wilkes was most fortunate as a lover and the damp sandy-haired saucer-eyed red-fisted mr slope was powerful only over the female breast there were however one or two of the neighbouring clergy who thought it not quite safe to neglect the baskets in which for the nonce were stored the loaves and fishes of the diocese of barchester they and they only came to call on mr slope after his performance in the cathedral pulpit among these mr quiverful the rector of puddingdale whose wife still continued to present him from year to year with fresh pledges of her love and so to increase his cares and it is to be hoped his happiness equally who can wonder that a gentleman with fourteen living children and a bare income of four hundred pounds a year should look after the loaves and fishes even when they are under the thumb of a mr slope very soon after the sunday on which the sermon was preached the leading clergy of the neighbourhood held high debate together as to how mr slope should be put down in the first place he should never again preach from the pulpit of barchester cathedral this was dr grantly's earliest dictum and they all agreed providing only that they had the power to exclude him dr grantly declared that the power rested with the dean and chapter observing that no clergyman out of the chapter had a claim to preach there saving only the bishop himself to this the dean assented but alleged that contests on such a subject would be unseemly to which rejoined a meagre little doctor one of the cathedral prebendaries that the contest must be all on the side of mr slope if every prebendary were always there ready to take his own place in the pulpit cunning little meagre doctor whom it suits well to live in his own cosy house within barchester close and who is well content to have his little fling at dr v z stanhope and other absentees whose italian villas or enticing london homes are more tempting than cathedral stalls and residences to this answered the burly chancellor a man rather silent indeed but very sensible that absent prebendaries had their vicars and that in such case the vicar's right to the pulpit was the same as that of the higher order to which the dean assented groaning deeply at these truths thereupon however the meagre doctor remarked that they would be in the hands of their minor canons one of whom might at any hour betray his trust whereon was heard from the burly chancellor an ejaculation sounding somewhat like pooh, pooh, pooh. but it might be that the worthy man was but blowing out the heavy breath from his windpipe why silence him at all suggested mr harding let them not be ashamed to hear what any man might have to preach to them 
unless he preached false doctrine in which case let the bishop silence him so spoke our friend vainly for human ends must be attained by human means but the dean saw a ray of hope out of those purblind old eyes of his yes let them tell the bishop how distasteful to them was this mr slope a new bishop just come to his seat could not wish to insult his clergy while the gloss was yet fresh on his first apron then up rose dr grantly and having thus collected the scattered wisdom of his associates spoke forth with words of deep authority when i say up rose the archdeacon i speak of the inner man which then sprang up to more immediate action for the doctor had bodily been standing all along with his back to the dean's empty fire grate and the tails of his frock coat supported over his two arms his hands were in his breeches pockets it is quite clear that this man must not be allowed to preach again in this cathedral we all see that except our dear friend here the milk of whose nature runs so softly that he would not have the heart to refuse the pope the loan of his pulpit if the pope would come and ask it we must not however allow the man to preach again here it is not because his opinion on church matters may be different from ours with that one would not quarrel it is because he has purposely insulted us when he went up into that pulpit last sunday his studied object was to give offence to men who had grown old in reverence of those things of which he dared to speak so slightingly what to come here a stranger a young unknown and unfriended stranger and tell us in the name of the bishop his master that we are ignorant of our duties old-fashioned and useless i don't know whether most to admire his courage or his impudence and one thing i will tell you that sermon originated solely with the man himself the bishop was no more a party to it than was the dean here you all know how grieved i am to see a bishop in this diocese holding the latitudinarian ideas by which dr proudie has made himself conspicuous you all know how greatly i should distrust the opinion of such a man but in this matter i hold him to be blameless i believe dr proudie has lived too long among gentlemen to be guilty or to instigate another to be guilty of so gross an outrage no that man uttered what was untrue when he hinted that he was speaking as the mouthpiece of the bishop it suited his ambitious views at once to throw down the gauntlet to us at once to defy us here in the quiet of our own religious duties here within the walls of our own loved cathedral here where we have for so many years exercised our ministry without schism and with good repute such an attack upon us coming from such a quarter is abominable abominable groaned the dean abominable muttered the meagre doctor abominable re-echoed the chancellor uttering the sound from the bottom of his deep chest i really think it was said mr harding most abominable 
and most unjustifiable continued the archdeacon but mr dean thank god that pulpit is still our own your own i should say that pulpit belongs solely to the dean and chapter of barchester cathedral and as yet mr slope is no part of that chapter you mr dean have suggested that we should appeal to the bishop to abstain from forcing this man on us but what if the bishop allow himself to be ruled by his chaplain in my opinion the matter is in our own hands mr slope cannot preach there without permission asked and obtained and let that permission be invariably refused let all participation in the ministry of the cathedral service be refused to him then if the bishop choose to interfere we shall know what answer to make to the bishop my friend here has suggested that this man may again find his way into the pulpit by undertaking the duty of some of your minor canons but i am sure that we may fully trust to these gentlemen to support us when it is known that the dean objects to any such transfer of course you may said the chancellor there was much more discussion among the learned conclave all of which of course ended in obedience to the archdeacon's commands they had too long been accustomed to his rule to shake it off so soon and in this particular case they had none of them a wish to abet the man whom he was so anxious to put down such a meeting as that we have just recorded is not held in such a city as barchester unknown and untold of not only was the fact of the meeting talked of in every respectable house including the palace but the very speeches of the dean the archdeacon and chancellor were repeated not without many additions and imaginary circumstances according to the tastes and opinions of the relators all however agreed in saying that mr slope was to be debarred from opening his mouth in the cathedral of barchester many believed that the vergers were to be ordered to refuse him even the accommodation of a seat and some of the most far-going advocates for strong measures declared that his sermon was looked upon as an indictable offence and that proceedings were to be taken against him for brawling the party who were inclined to defend him the enthusiastically religious young ladies and the middle-aged spinsters desirous of a move of course took up his defence the more warmly on account of this attack if they could not hear mr slope in the cathedral they would hear him elsewhere they would leave the dull dean the dull old prebendaries and the scarcely less dull young minor canons to preach to each other they would work slippers and cushions and hem bands for mr slope make him a happy martyr and stick him up in some new scion or bethesda and put the cathedral quite out of fashion dr and mrs proudie at once returned to london they thought it expedient not to have to encounter any personal application from the dean and chapter respecting the sermon till the violence of the storm had expended itself but they left mr slope behind them nothing daunted and he went about his work zealously flattering such as would listen to his flattery whispering religious twaddle into the ears of foolish women ingratiating himself with the few clergy who would receive him visiting the houses of the poor inquiring into all people prying into everything and searching with his minutest eye into all palatial dilapidations he did not however make any immediate attempt to preach again in the cathedral and so all barchester was by the ears 
End of chapter 7 Recording by Nick Whitley, Purley, United Kingdom